Hey folks, so I want to explain what the generators of the group Z mod and Z are. So I'll explain some of the relevant terms as we go. But the main theorem is that the generators of Z mod and Z are all of the integers R that are um, from one up to N minus one, and which furthermore are relatively prime to N. In other words, the greatest common divisor of R and N has to equal one. So GCD stands for the greatest common divisor. And we'll, we'll see some examples later where we compute some greatest common divisors of numbers. All right, <clears throat> let me review some of the words that we're using here. So if, if G is any group and A is any element in that group, then you can define the cyclic subgroup generated by this element A. And here we're doing it in multiplicative notation. So the cyclic subgroup generated by A, this is how you write it, is, is all things of the form, well, the identity A times itself once, you know, or, you know, and then A times itself, a cubed, which would be A times A times A. And then you have A inverse and A inverse combined with itself, et cetera. All right. So what do I want to say? Um, I want to say what it means for you to be cyclic. So a group is cyclic if it's equal to one of its cyclic subgroups, okay? If there's some element A that generates the entire group. And in this case, we say that A generates the group G. So this is what it means for an element to be a generator of a group. If you can take a single element and combine it with itself and combine its inverse with, with the inverse and produce every single element in the group, then that's what it means for that element A to generate the cyclic group G. All of this here is in multiplicative notation. Elements in our group are being multiplied together. In Z mod NZ, you know, the operation is addition. So I'm going to rewrite this in additive notation. Okay. So in additive notation, you combine something with itself, um, you know, by adding it to itself many times. In additive notation, the identity is often just written as zero. And then here we have A, but then A combined with itself would be a plus A, which folks sometimes call 2A. Okay. And then you would also have A plus A plus A coming next. And A inverse is just the same inverse, although in additive notation, folks usually write the inverse as negative A. And then you can combine negative A with itself two times to get negative A plus negative A, which usually you might call negative 2A. Okay, <laughs> we've got a fair bit to unpack here. I think the only way to do this is via some examples. And let me erase for a bit, give myself some more space. Wonderful. So let's do Z mod 60 as an example. We're gonna go through and find all of the cyclic subgroups and um, see if those corresponding elements generate the entire group or not. So the cyclic subgroup generated by zero only contains zero. No matter how many times you add zero to itself, you always get zero. Cyclic subgroup generated by one I usually start with the element 
itself when I write down the subgroup. So, you know, really I'm starting here. I'm starting with A, which in this case is one. Then A plus A is one plus one, which is two. And then keep going. A plus A plus A is three. We get four, five, and then we get all the way up to six, but six mod six is zero. The cyclic subgroup generated by two, I start with two, and then I add two to get four. I add two again to get six, but that's zero. Cyclic subgroup generated by three, I start with three, and then I add three to get six, but six is zero in this group. And once you get to zero, the identity, you'll notice that you don't need to keep going because this is three, a single time. Three plus three is six, which is zero. And then when I add three again, I just get back to where I started. So combining three with itself three times here was just the same as S3 combined with itself uh, once. And then combining three with itself four times, we've already seen that because that's just three plus three. Cyclic subgroup generated by four. We start with four. Four plus four is eight, which mod six is two. And then two plus four is six, which mod six is zero. And then I'm done. If I add four again, I just get back to four. And then the cyclic subgroup generated by five. Five. five plus five is 10, which mod six is four. Four plus five is nine, which mod six is um, three. Three plus five is eight, which mod six is two. You get the pattern. <laughs> two plus six is eight, which, I'm uh, sorry, two plus five is seven, which mod six is one. And one plus five is six, which mod six is zero. All right. So what are the elements that generate Z mod 60? They're one and five. Because when I started this process with one, I generated every element in this group. And when I started with this process with five, I generated every element in this group. Zero only generates a single element itself. Two only generated the even elements. Three only generated three and zero four only generated the even elements, okay? So the generators of Z mod 60 are one and five. So now we can look at this theorem. This theorem is telling us that instead of doing all of that computation that I did down below, there's a faster way to recognize ahead of time whether an element R is going to generate a group or not. So you, you just need to compute the GCD of R with n, you know, to figure out whether r generates z mod nz. Let's compute all these GCDs and then I'll say a little bit more. Okay, zero, you don't really compute GCDs involving zero. We've ruled out zero as a possible generator from the start. Okay, let's compute the GCD of one and six. So in this case, you know, my n is six because I'm looking at z mod 60. And I'm going to let r vary from one up to, up to five. So r is going to be one up to five as I go through this. What's the greatest common divisor of one and six? Well, you know, the largest integer that divides into one is one. So this GCD is one. What's the greatest common divisor of two and six? Well. Uh, it's two. Two goes into both two and six. The greatest common divisor of three and six is three, which divides into both. The greatest common divisor of four and six. Notice that four does not divide six, but two divides both four and six. And two is the greatest common divisor. And then the greatest common divisor of five and six. Well, five is prime, so, and five does not divide six. So this created common divisor is one. So I can look here, five and six were the only numbers R such that when I took these GCDs, I got one. And that's how I could have known in advance 
that one and five were going to generate this group, but the element, other elements weren't. We haven't given a proof of this theorem, but I think your intuition to kick in to help you see what's going on. When you start with one, which has no common divisors with six, when you add copies of one to itself, you have to wrap around and, and hit every element in the group before you get to the identity. And same with five. You have to wrap all the way around before you get back to the identity. But when you start with an element like three that has a common divisor with six, well, you know, once you add three to itself two times, you get to six because three times two is six. So this um, means that you lose your opportunity to generate the entire group if you have a common divisor with n um, trying to generate z mod n z. All right. Thanks so much.